uh, COVID crisis response from social science conference. Um, it is amazing to think that uh, we started talking about this three and a half weeks ago, <laughs> and it is now on its third iteration. Um, the, the panels have only gotten better, and this is uh, a brilliant panel. It's on work and organizations in the time of COVID-19. Uh, we have three excellent speakers. Uh, we've got uh, Finian Buckley, uh, Professor at TCU. We've got Deirdre O'Shea, Senior Lecturer at UL, and we've got Nuala Whelan, who is a postdoc in Maynooth University. Um, they're all experts in their field, and um, we are very excited to hear what they have to say. So w the format is as before. We've got 15 minutes for each speaker. You know, it, it doesn't need to be exactly 15 minutes, but 15 in and around. Um, and then at the end, uh, uh, the panelists will take your questions. So. Um, in order to do that, you need to um, put a question in through the Q&A uh, um, uh, session, and that'll come to me, and we'll, I'll be uh, able to read out the questions to uh, the panelists and um, uh, get their responses in kind of a round-robin session. So I'm uh, really looking forward to hearing these talks. So, Finian, are you uh, ready to go? I'm ready to go, Mar. Or Stephen, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. All right, great. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn off the video and I'm going to be listening with interest. And uh, please uh, take it away. The, the uh, floor, as it were, is yours. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to just bring up a, a few slides and talk to those as we go along. So bear with me just for a moment as I get that up. Here we go. Hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, a little bit just to set the context, I suppose. Um, who am I? I'm a psychologist, uh, specialised in the area of work psychology, and I'm based at the Business School in DCU. Uh, we have uh, about, I think it's seven work psychologists working within the Business School at the, at the moment there. So probably the, the largest cluster of applied business and work psychologists in the country. Um, what do I want to share with you this morning? I'm going to take a very specific take on uh, looking at motivating staff. Um, I'm going to take a leadership perspective. That's what I've been asked to do this morning. So I'm standing in the shoes of a manager or a leader who is facing these rather challenging times with, uh, let's say, most of their workers now consigned to working from home or virtual working. Uh, so a very different context to that which we'll say this manager or leader faced about a month ago. Um, I have a very particular take on this. There's, uh, there's a lot in the media about do's and don'ts uh, in the workplace at the moment and working in virtual teams. I'm, I'm a psychologist, I'm a research psychologist. So everything that you're going to hear from me over the next 15 minutes, the slides that I showed you are psychological science based. So in other words, this is evidence based stuff uh, from our top peer reviewed uh, journals. It's not personal opinion, it's not anecdote, it's not a lot of what we're getting in the media, which is this person's opinion versus that person's opinion. So that's my, that's my context setter, I suppose, at the beginning. Uh, let me move to my second slide. Um, and this is where I, I want to just speak a little bit for a few moments about this particular context. Um, it's special and I think as, as leaders and managers we need to step back a little bit and understand what's going on. Um, so three points I'd like to make at the beginning. Um, let's all admit from the very beginning that since the announcement for lockdown, the, the, uh, the restrictions that were in place on us uh, in mid-March, uh, all of us, to, to all of us this is new. Um, so we are suffering a degree of stress. Now, for some of us, this stress was sort of exciting. Oh, this is, this is new, this is different. This is an opportunity to, to do things differently, to try out new ways of working and so forth. But don't be in any doubt, uh, this is a significant change for all of us. I mean, for some of us, we've, we've been furlonged. Others have, are unemployed. Others among us are trying to run businesses that uh, really just can't be run in the current context. So a whole series of different, um, uh, I suppose, challenges facing us. Uh, but the one thing that our psychological research tells us is every single one of us listening to this has a different suffering and are experiencing a different level of stress right now than you were a month, a month and a half ago. And while, for, as I mentioned, for some of us that may be challenging and exciting, as time goes on, it begins to deplete our resources. Um, 
So increased stress levels, prolonged stress levels, even if they're just sort of challenging and exciting stress, it does deplete our resources. And here's the important point from psychological research for leaders and managers to understand when thinking about your teams working from home. Additional stress, elevated stress levels, even if only small, they deplete our cognitive abilities. What does that mean, Finia? It means they actually influence our ability to problem solve, to think clearly and rationally. In other words, our threshold has been lowered a little bit. So we've got to be aware of that. Our people that are working from home are not working at the same cognitive level, at the same brain functioning level as they were a month and month and a half ago. So that's a number one that we need to keep in mind. And for us as leaders and managers, this is important. That's why we're leaders and managers. We need to be aware of these sort of contextual changes and we need to be able to adapt and, and, uh, and manage those. So first step is uh, just to understand that. The second one, uh, when working with our, our uh, and dealing and managing with our workers working uh, from home is to, is to realize that the uh, motivation is also altered. Um, this, this isn't a voluntary uh, experience for most people. They would prefer to be in the workplace, co-located with other workers doing what they do normally. But this has been, I suppose, in a sense, inflicted on us. So we need to understand that when somebody says, I'm going to change your, your work rhythm entirely, I'm going to change your workplace entirely, and I want you to start working from home, that's imposed on us. It's no longer voluntary. In other words, this isn't what they signed up for. This isn't what our team signed up for um, some, some, whenever they joined the firm. Uh, now, I'll admit some, some uh, and, and European, uh, European uh, stats suggest to us that one in four of us, between one in four and one in five of us are working from home at least one or two days a week prior to, to COVID. But that means 70 or 80% of us just went to the workplace uh, day in, day out. Um, uh, and that's where we prefer to be, even if the commute was stressful, that's where we prefer to be. This is imposed, so it's not voluntary, so our motivation to engage in the work that we're, we need to do is a little different to that which it was a month ago. So again, as leaders and managers, we need to be aware of that. We need to put that into, put it on our radar, I guess, uh, for when we're dealing with, uh, with our employees that are working virtually. And uh, my, my final point on this context setting, um, this isn't home working as we know it. In other words, we have 20 or 30 years of really good psychological research that speaks to us about uh, the, the challenges and the positives and the negatives of, of home working or, or virtual working. This isn't typical virtual working. This is an imposed uh, teleworking scenario. Uh, many of the people who are, many of us who are working from home, if we were to choose to do so, wouldn't do so in the same context. In other words, we wouldn't be at home with our children, with our partners, with our dependents, with all the other uh, rhythms of life that are going on at the moment. That's, that's not how we would do it. People who were teleworking or virtually working before the COVID lockdown were doing so where they had all their childcare supports, their school supports, everything there that, uh, that assisted them to focus on their work in periods, uh, in periods when we'll say there weren't dependents sharing their office space with them. So it's not typical home working. We can't really depend on the, the, the traditional home working research to give us deep insights into what's happening here. And let me show you a, a, a little bit uh, of, of how, how different it might be. So I mentioned earlier that everything I'm going to share with you is, is science based. This one slide isn't. This is more uh, my, I suppose, depiction of what the difference between the rhythm of a worker that goes to the office or goes to the plant and works for a day, how their work uh, performance levels uh, alterate or, or uh, fluctuate over a day in comparison with somebody that may be now uh, engaged in this sort of enforced working from home. So the yellow, the yellow line on my graph, uh, on my hypothetical graph, 
would show what uh, research tells us about uh, peak performance levels for most people when they go to, to work in a co-located uh, um, environment. In other words, we start the day, we have our coffee and whatever, and there's a really high peak period in mid-morning where we're, we're sort of working at fourth gear, absolutely all cylinders burning. We may drop a little bit at lunchtime, obviously, and then we, never, we have that sort of post-lunch slump. Uh, our energy level is not as high, but we get back to a peak again in mid-afternoon, and then we're closing off our work towards the end of the day and we head home. Now, for some of us, we head home and we pick up work again a little bit later. But compare that graph to the purple line that's on your screen now. This is my hypothesized rhythm for a typical or any uh, a, a worker who is working from home that's in force doing so, maybe doesn't have the, uh, the office set up that they would like. Uh, but also we're sharing duties at home. So we have no schools, no crashes. So uh, all parents are, uh, and guardians are involved in schooling at some level or other, childcare at some le le level or other. So look at that rhythm. That's enormously different. The, the purple rhythm is different uh, to the, the yellow rhythm, significantly so. So putting on my hat as a leader of a team or a manager of, of a remote workers, I need to be aware of this. I can't any longer say, well, I'm expecting Tony to put in or, or Mary to put in a six hour day. That's just not viable. Look at that graph. Tony can't put in a six, six hour day or Mary can't put in a six or eight hour day like they used to. And we just have to accept that. Until schools go back, until we have all the other support systems in place, the expectation that we work a typical eight hour working day, we have to set it aside. And to replace that, we need to take on as leaders the idea that this is project work, uh, that the people who are working from home are working on a project. We're not looking at the same sort of timelines within a daily clock anymore. Uh, so we need to switch that clock off. There's a different pattern of working. Now. So moving on, um, what can you, you uh, as, as a leader do? To, to manage effectively those who are working at home. I would say long before you even start to thinking about how you're going to manage your team or your workers, I think you need to step back and, and reflect yourself first. So start with yourself. Uh, how do I feel about this? How does this make me feel trying to manage people remotely from my office or my front room or my kitchen table now? Uh, how does it make, it, have made me feel? How do, how do I translate what I was good at in a co-located or an office scenario uh, into a virtual uh, into a virtual environment. Maybe I can't. Maybe the things I was good at I can't translate. Um, and we've got to be clear also about what our goals are now. Are the goals for me as a team leader or as a as a manager of a unit are they the same goals that I had a month and month and a half ago? And I suspect they may not be. I think our goals may be switching and changing depending on uh, where our firm is at the moment. The second point I would say to you is, look, it's, it's anxiety inducing. For many of us, it's very different. But uh, let's not the, allow the challenge to, to overwhelm us to the point where we run away from it, where we say, look, I, I, I can't do this. This is just a, a step too far. Rather, treat it as a sort of a, a, learning, a, a learning opportunity, a, a challenge opportunity, an opportunity where I develop new skills and new uh, uh, new insights and, and new experience in my leadership journey. So it looks like at the end of this whole period, there will be a lot more virtual working happening. So how, how do I hone these new skills that will be required for, for a manager of the future who is probably going to have to do this more often? You're not an expert. Nobody is an expert at this. Uh, we have some people who are really good at managing virtual teams, but remember, this is not traditional teleworking. This is a new scenario. Um, nobody has been in this situation before where the structures are not in place to help our uh, remote workers do their job uh, in, in a traditional way. Um, so you're not the expert. You, you shouldn't come across as the expert. We're almost in, in a joint journey here where we all find out what works and what, what doesn't work. So you need to be authentic about that. Uh, your job probably here is to coach more than, than anything else and to understand what's happening, to map out what's happening so that you can craft, I suppose, the best way to be, or the way to be the best leader and best uh, manager for your team in this current context. Uh, so it will be different. You'll be doing different things, leading a team remotely uh, than you did uh, a month, a month and a half ago. 
So this is my uh, my little piece, and I know my my two panelists, my fellow panelists, that are coming up after me, are going to speak a little bit about motivation. But just to give us a a, a sort of a to bring it back to our minds, I think as a manager or a leader of remote, remote workers, we need to go back to basics here and try and understand what is it that's uh, what's motivating my my uh, my team workers and my employees now. Look, we know about the extrinsic motivations, things like pay, reward, recognition, all of those things. The economists have that squared off for us uh, uh, for the last 20 or 30 years. But what we know too is that that's probably only about 25 25 or 30 percent of the overall motivation cake. There's a big chunk that uh, most of us uh, who engage in our work, we come to work because of intrinsic factors. Um, and that's something I think we need to just put on the agenda for leaders and managers at the moment to, to find out, do, do you understand your workers? Do you understand those on your team working from home? Do you understand what motivates them? Um, and if you don't, I think it's sort of incumbent upon us to, to do so. Uh, because if you're going to help them uh, hit peak performance, then you need to be able to unlock what their motivators are and how these play out in the current context. So uh, when it comes to this, we're talking really here about the intrinsic motivation piece. And we know from current research, you can leave your Maslow's and your Hertzberg's and all that sort of historical stuff behind you. This is our, our current best practice model for motivation, which is self-determination theory. And it speaks about intrinsic motivation coming from doing a job where I can show my competence, where I can meet challenges, where I stretch myself, uh, where uh, autonomy, where I get some choice to do what I want to do. Uh, in the way that I want to do it. In other words, I'm not controlled completely in what I'm doing. Rather, I'm able to have some uh, some some ownership of it, some empowerment. Uh, and the third is we all like to be involved in a job that has some meaning, has some purpose, and that we're doing it in tandem and uh, in collaboration with others. So there's an interconnectedness. So these are the three factors that press that 40 or 50 percent but button for uh, performance. So. Uh, moving, moving on from that, when we look at all the research and how you, how you sort of land these three, the, the, the one point that keeps coming up in all the research with remote learning and uh, remote leading is it is so important for your team to trust you, even more so than when they're uh, in a co-located or an office situation. So trust becomes the, uh, the key factor. Uh, and let me talk to you a little bit about trust uh, here. Really, what we're talking about is, and there's two factors to trust uh, and how you communicate trust. Uh, and the way I characterize it is, this is this is my last slide really, is uh, into two, two core dimensions. The first dimension of trust is warmth. So if you want your uh, remote employees to feel uh, that they can trust you more, as particularly in this context, then you've got to show warmth and show it more than you would have back in the office. Because back in the office, we can pick up cues all day long from, from watching uh, our leaders and our managers. In this scenario, uh, in a remote smart scenario, the, the cues just aren't there. We have Zoom calls and some tele calls or, or uh, we're sharing Microsoft Office or whatever it is but really the cues are few and far between. So it's up to the leader and the manager to stretch out and to, to lean out and, and show and, and display these cues. So some ways of doing that, um, I think you've got to support our, the employees with their task. task. Many of what, much of what they're doing is new. Um, so I think you need to be open and say, look, how can I help you do this? Are there problems or challenges that you're facing? How can I be assistance? Can I give you some help, some, uh, whether it be technical, digital, whatever is the assistance and resources that you need, how can I, how can I help you with it? Give that autonomy. Remember the rhythm of the working day. So take take the the the, the daily uh, production piece off the agenda. Give a lot more autonomy and say, okay, here's the project. We know what the goals are. When do you think that you can deliver on that? So be open and and uh, and honest about the the boundaries, I guess, with, with regard to the projects. And things will happen. There'll be problems along the way. People have dependents that are ill or are or undergoing particular challenges. So you need to be available as well to, to, uh, to, to, to interact with them. And one of the things that I think is important here is that we need to schedule one-to-ones with our team members. 
That's the only way you'll get to understand what's going on for them. So our job may be bigger than it was traditionally in, in just dealing with managing team meetings. I think you need to go offline and do one-to-one -one with your team members to understand what's going on for them, to make them feel safe in the, in the current context. On the other side of this, uh, over from the warmth is a competence piece. Um, and, and here we're not saying you need to be Superman or Superwoman. Uh, this is new to us all. We're finding our way, but there are some things that uh, the research would show that are important for you to, to consider uh, in terms of what the, the behaviours that you display. Show that you're conscientious about the work, that you care, even though we're all stressed and we have our breaking points, that you are still plugged into what's happening. You're diligent about doing your job and getting projects over the line, that you want to keep uh, to, to commitments, uh, but be consistent also. So some teams, they, they work out a system of, of, you know, we text when this is happening, we phone call in emergency scenarios, and then we have Zooms every two or three days, and we have a weekly recap. So, you know, get, get a sort of a rhythm that, that suits the full team into, uh, into the agenda. You're still the manager and the leader, so you, you need to do that strategic thinking. You need to be proactive, not just reactive. It's still your job to coordinate what's happening. So you need to think ahead about things. And, and I suppose where challenges and problems, uh, you can see them coming down the tracks that you're working proactively to take them off the agenda for your, uh, for your employees. Humor is important. We have some great research on this, that uh, having sort of social time in your Zoom meetings is important. And humor is really, really a positive way of breaking down the tension and I suppose making some of the communications more informal. You've got to be feedback friendly. It's no longer just the, the once a week or once every month uh, feedback sessions. Feedback's got to be built into all team meetings and all one-to-ones. You need to gather all the intelligence, all the understanding of what's happening in this new situation if you're going to sort of coordinate a team uh, or a group that is working virtually and remotely. So my time is almost up. Um, I'm really happy to take questions from now. I'm going to just draw your attention to, uh, to a piece of research that um, uh, Deirdre O'Shea, who's one of the other panellists, um, Bernie Nocton from the um, Athlone Institute of Technology, and myself and the team from DCU uh, Research Group, who are looking at uh, the ministerial speeches, and particularly the one that's coming up this evening, and looking at uh, citizens' reactions to that. For those of you that are interested, the QR code is there, uh, and the link is there if you'd like to take a part in that. We'd be delighted to hear from you. Stephen, I'm going back to you now. Fantastic, uh, Finian. Thank you very much. You're you're uh, you're you're definitely an innovator because th th that was a fantastic talk. But this is the first time we've got live research happening inside of the 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 work uh, or 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 the talk, which is brilliant. Um, that's a cool. that's a that's a genuine innovation. Thank you very much. There's a few questions coming in, but I will uh, pass um, right over now to uh, uh, my UL colleague Deirdre O'Shea. Please, Deirdre, take it away. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thanks very much, Finian. Uh, just bear with me for one second until I also share my screen and get these slides up. Um, okay, so hopefully you can see those slides um, as a slideshow. Yeah, here we go. So. Thanks very much, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the session so far. Um, as we were thinking about how we would design this, um, Finian is focusing on the leader and the manager perspective. And I thought um, that it might be useful to also take some reflection time to think about how we as employees, as workers, as people are actually managing this um, crisis as well and how we're trying to figure out um, how we keep going, how we manage our motivation, how we manage all of our lives that are going on as well as our work at the moment and to take a look at that. Um, as, as Finian, similarly to Finian, I'm also a work and organizational psychologist and I am um, primarily focused on looking at how we design and evaluate interventions to help people in the workplace and so this has been a very interesting time because of course our entire world has changed overnight, um, not just our work and how we work, but the way in which we go about managing our lives and managing everything that goes along with the stresses and strains of a, a, a global pandemic, a pandemic, which is uh, the first time I think everybody in the entire world has experienced this type of um, situation. So 
Along with that comes a lot of worry, comes a lot of anxiety, um, come, uh, as well as the normal day-to-day -day stuff that we are still trying to, to, to do and to um, manage our, our lives and our work. And I want to talk a little bit about how we actually manage that and regulate that. And if we do have to continue working in a somewhat um, uh, non-typical fashion for a period of time, how we develop a stain sustainable way of doing that. Um, what we have been dealing with for the last number of weeks is, is crisis mode. Um, we have all been in crisis mode. The entire world has increasingly been in crisis mode. And we've been trying to manage that and deal with that. Um, and if we reflect on how work has changed for us, we can think about different, um, I suppose, groups of workers. Um, so there are many of us um, who are working from home um, and trying to deal with the fact that there are no longer separations between homework or home life and work life. Um, there are people who are on the front line, so we've heard a lot about um, how um, obviously healthcare workers, um, but also people who work in supermarkets, who are delivery workers, who um, are um, trying to um, keep businesses going or find new ways to, to manage businesses um, who, who cannot now interact with people. Um, so um, cafes, restaurants, um, um, and, and all those types of things. And that presents a somewhat different way of thinking about um, work and what work has become for people who are on the front line. Um, there's an awful lot of anxiety that suddenly come into um, going into um, work in a supermarket, for example, which wouldn't have been there six or eight weeks ago. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, we have healthcare workers who are literally on the front line, are day to day dealing with people who are sick, but not, not with COVID-19, but also without COVID-19, trying to manage um, their own anxiety, their own worries, while also trying to manage um, to take care of people and so on. We also have a group of workers who are still going out to work um, and trying to manage that in a socially distant way and, and deal with the, um, the added um, uh, issues that come with that. And of course, we have quite a large number of people who are now unemployed and trying to understand and, and um, deal with the, the worry, the anxiety, the change to their lifestyle that comes with that. And our third speaker, Nula, is going to talk a bit more about that. So I'm not going to um, put too much focus on that group because Nula will, will talk um, in a lot more detail about that. For all these types of workers, we're trying to manage ourselves at the moment. So there are a lot of um, thoughts and um, uh, that are going around in our minds. We're thinking about COVID-19 a lot. Um, we're thinking about how we're going to homeschool children. We're thinking about how we're going to try to concentrate at work, how we're going to get work done and so on. Um, and a lot of that is challenging at the moment because there's an awful lot of um, emotion management that we're trying to deal with or maybe not so successfully dealing with in, in many situations as well. So there's the obvious stress, the worry, the coping that comes with trying to deal with these situations. Um, but on the other side of that, there's um, workers, particularly people who are still going out to work or still interacting with the public or with patients and so on, who are trying to deal with the emotions of others. Um, so there has been, for example, um, some anecdotal evidence from newspapers and so on about um, for example, supermarket workers who are trying to um, who are experience a lot of verbal aggression and incivility from, from customers and so on. And that adds another layer of stress and anxiety um, that people have to deal with. We also have to manage our motivations. So, you know, we don't have that, you know, alarm clock going off in the morning. We have to get out of bed straight away. We have to get into work for a particular time. Um, there is so much else going on for us at the moment that we also have to, to think about and to manage the way in which um, we are motivated and we can motivate ourselves. And we're going to talk a little bit more in a few minutes about how we do that. And then there's also concerns for us about how are we managing our performance? How are we managing our well-being? Are we performing as we should be? And as Philine um, mentioned in the previous um, talk, we cannot possibly be performing at the same level that we were six or eight weeks ago. Um, and organizations and, and um, businesses also cannot possibly be managing at, at the same performance levels. And that in and of itself brings different types of stresses and strains where we're worrying about, is there um, um, going to be products that we need and get and so on. Um, and we're also trying to manage our well-being. So we're trying to um, 
do all of this and all of this is going on in our minds and, and we're trying to um, you know, exercise within our two kilometer limits and so on and so forth. So that brings challenges in and of itself. I think the other thing that's worth mentioning and I've kind of alluded to the fact that in many um, jobs, people are trying to also manage the emotions of others, manage the thoughts of others, but we are, we are both doing this for ourselves and, and we are doing it for others and possibly to a greater extent than we would normally. So for example, we might have um, family members who are cocooning and we're trying to make sure that we can that, um, bring their shopping to um, and leave it outside their, their house or their wall or something like that. Um, we're trying to, um, help our children to, to deal with this and, and adjust to the, the new um, situation that they find themselves in. Um, many people may have children doing exams and there's an awful lot of worry and anxiety that comes about that. So what this leads us to then is this um, situation where um, you know, we have all this stuff going on in our minds, all this stuff going on in our lives, and sometimes it can seem like too much. And so what I want to talk a, a little bit about is, um, first of all, put some, um, particular lenses on this that we can, that helps us to understand it, but also helps us to manage it a bit more until some stage in the future we come back to um, what might be um, the, the actual normal as opposed to the new normal. I don't think we should get too used to the new normal, hopefully. So one way of looking at this is the idea of um, the, what, what we sometimes refer to as stop and start self-control. I don't like the word control, so I've used the word self-regulation, but the idea that that we are trying to stop ourselves worrying too much. We are trying to, in some ways, manage the boundaries between our working life, which may be non-existent at the moment. We are trying to maintain a work day. So there's a lot of types of things that we're trying to stop ourselves doing or to at least keep some kind of control over. And as Finian mentioned in the previous week, um, talk, this can be very, very um, depleting because it's very resource intensive to try to try to make sure we're not worrying too much, try to make sure that we're concentrating on our jobs, trying to um, keep some boundaries in our lives. We're trying to stop ourselves doing an awful lot of things. Um, we're also trying to make sure that we can forget about work, hopefully, um, if that's um, somewhat, but I don't know if it's possible at the moment, but certainly it's more challenging than it normally is. And the other side of that is we're trying to start or trying to keep ourselves doing things. So we're trying to stay focused, trying to concentrate. Um, we're trying to motiv motivate ourselves to keep going. Um, that in and of itself has particular challenges as well. And what this means is that all of this is taking up an awful lot of energy, an awful lot of time, um, and it is hugely uh, resource depleting for us and hugely energy depleting. And what we often find is that trying to stop ourselves doing things can be a bit more challenging than trying to start things. So if, for example, you find yourself um, lying in bed at night and suddenly you're worrying about things or um, you're waiting for that you know daily briefing at whatever, whatever it is half five or six o'clock every day um, and you find that suddenly your your um, anxiety work and your um, your level of worry is is going out of control it can be very challenging to just say well just stop that so one simple little thing that we can try to do well it's not so simple, it sounds simple, but sometimes it's not all that simple, um, is instead of trying to stop ourselves worry, worrying, instead of trying to stop ourselves um, from doing X, Y, and Z, if we um, switch the focus a little bit and just take a small task that we can achieve in 20 or 30 minutes and turn off um, social media, turn off the news, turn off everything else, and just focus on that. So being able to achieve very small little, um, yeah, little wins, if you want to look at it like that, um, even if that's just cleaning the kitchen or something like that, or it's um, getting one small task done that, that you need to do in your day can be, can be quite useful. Um, so sometimes switching the focus from trying to stop things to trying to start little things can be, can be quite useful. The, the, there are a number of implications of this idea that we only have a certain amount of resources. Um, we only have a certain amount of um, of psychological resources in terms of what can take up space in our minds. Um, we only have a certain amount of resources for managing our emotions. The more that we have to try to manage this stuff and, the, and that is particularly pertinent in the, in the current situation, the more depleted we come. The long-term implications of that is that if we are constantly depleting our resources or we're, we're exhausted from worrying, we're exhausted from trying to get work done, is that we start um, on a downward spiral. In the long term, this can lead to burnout. So one of the things we have that are challenging us at the moment is that we need to come up with a sustainable way of living our lives 
where we can manage ourselves, manage all the worries that come about, manage our work life and so on, um, so that we can switch that to an upward spiral, spiral. And what that means is that we can develop ways and means through which we can, um, we can manage to um, go about and, and deliver what we need to in the current situation. And I'm going to talk about a few strategies that um, are beneficial for doing that. It's not SOS, it's close to it. Um, we're not talking about emergency signals, it's SOC. So three ways that we can go about um, trying to um, develop strategies for managing our, our lives and our work at the moment um, is through a, a, life plan, a lifespan perspective. And this was a model that was developed um, a, a couple of decades ago. Um, which looks or takes a global view of managing all stages of human development. So it's relevant for us in the workplace, but it's also relevant to our lives beyond that. Um, and one thing about that is how, how we are deciding on priorities. And that's really the S part, the selection part. In normal times, um, we prefer to have some choice over how we um, go about um, conducting our work, for example, or conducting our lives. We might and try to choose things that we are more interested in or and so on and so forth. What we are actually in at the moment is what's called loss based selection. So we have had um, yeah, a huge um, uh, global pandemic, which has meant that we have much less choice, our levels of functionings are challenged. Um, and what we have to do here is we have to prioritize. So we have to look at, if we're looking at our workplace, for example, we have to think about how do we uh, prioritize the things that are most important. So what are the most important tasks that we have to get done? Um, can we abandon things that are less important for the moment? Um, can we think about what are the most important things to spend our time on? Um, try to break it down into small, um, smaller time chunks, for example, particularly if um, trying to get a, a larger chunk of time is challenging for us at the moment. Um, so we are in a situation of loss-based selection and in that situation we have to, to prioritize. The second part of that, the O, is the optimization. And that's really about how we allocate our effort and how we allocate our time. So that we are, for example, trying to limit the amount of time we spend, um, and I'm thinking, I, I'm using an example of something I've been doing at the moment, um, which is um, trying to not think about the amount of um, yeah, the daily briefing or the daily numbers and so on, um, that we are looking at where our effort is best put, um, where we can, how our limited resources um, cannot be um, uh, consumed by things that are maybe not as important and so on. And the third part of, part of this is compensation. And I think that's where a lot of us are at the moment is that we're trying to counteract, counteract all of the different losses and um, stresses and strains that are coming about doing it. And some, um, ways of, of thinking about how we might um, do that I have on the, the next slide, um, which is uh, where I'll, I'll finish after this. Um, there is um, a lot of, um, an awful lot of evidence suggesting that we have to find some time every day to try to recover from work. And if we don't do that, we will um, over time become burnt out. And there's a number of ways of doing that. Um, one of the, the biggest things we have to do at the moment is trying to find ways to detach. We normally talk about detaching from work, but we also have to try to forget about, um, or put to one side, at least for some part of the day, um, the worry and stresses and strain that come about um, by trying to deal with the global pandemic. Um, one of the most effective ways of, de of recovering from work is through what's called mastery experiences. And, and interestingly, they're, they're one of the things that are quite um, challenging at the moment because we normally talk about mastery experiences of being, um, you know, going out and, and learning a new, um, a new skill or exercising or doing something that we feel a sense of achievement from. Of course, that becomes quite challenging or at least our little world within which we can do that has to be done within two, two kilometers at the moment. But another very important one is to find time to relax. Um, so finding time to shut down the computer, to shut down um, social media, um, to take some time to relax, whether and everybody has different um, ways they like to do that, whether it's through um, meditation or yoga or um, having some fun with um, your family or trying to just um, yeah, throw a ball around the back garden or something like that for a while. But the important thing of all of these um, of all of these things that we do to try to recover from work every day is that we normally have quite a lot of control over that. We choose what we do outside of um, work in the, in the norm. And so one of the important things when you're trying to think about how you take some time to recover from work is that you take some, you try to choose or you try to make a conscious decision about what you're doing. And that idea of choice 
um, or control or having some little bit of autonomy is um, particularly important for us. So that's um, some tips hopefully that will help you, but also um, I hope give some insights into um, why and how we are experiencing um, the COVID-19 and the new way of working as being so challenging for us at the moment. So back over to you again, Stephen. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Um, I, I, I particularly need the advice to stay off social media. I'm a, I'm a, a bit of a junkie with it. Um, but uh, uh, please, a uh, reminder to everyone, uh, send in your questions to the Q&A um, uh, uh, portion. And uh, Nula, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm just ready here, Stephen. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to try and share my screen here. Okay, so I think that's, that should be working okay now. So um, thank you very much um, for the invitation this morning. Um, so uh, I am a work and organizational psychologist. Um, I'm working at Maynooth University at the moment on a research project looking at public employment services and career guidance or employment guidance, um, particularly for those most distant from the labour market. Uh, but I also have 20 years practitioner experience working uh, in Ballymun Job Centre. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about this morning, I suppose, is trying to look at ways in which we can support uh, the unemployed um, better, um, uh, helping them to maintain good uh, well-being while being unemployed and the different strategies that maybe we can consider using. Um, so uh, first of all, I suppose the, the COVID-related uh, unemployment crisis has been really very sharp and fast and we've seen these types of headlines, unemployment jumping, over one million people now dependent on state income, um, the exasperated mental health um, related issues, and also the, there's kind of worry that the long lingering impacts of um, unemployment may be with us for quite a while. And we saw recently um, the Department of Finance um, stability report update, and they, they were able to show us that um, at the end of 2019, we had about 4.5% unemployment and at the end of quarter one, that's risen to 9.1 and with an expected peak of 22% um, mid-year. So that's very worrying in terms of unemployment figures. And we can see that there are huge numbers now dependent on some kind of state um, um, support. So nearly 600,000 people on the pandemic unemployment payment, the new payment introduced on the 16th of March. Um, there were already over 200,000 people on the live register at that time and uh, 281,000 on the temporary wage subsidies. So um, really very large numbers. Um, and I think over the coming days, we'll see the new unemployment figures, um, how much change has happened there. But I suppose these kind of state supports really help to mitigate against some of the hardship experienced by the unemployed um, during periods of um, unemployment. And we did see that during the last recession that really um, it helped many people to stay um, above the poverty line. Um, and we know that some groups have been hit more than others. So on this graph, we can see the blue line indicates people who are on the pandemic unemployment um, payment. And the red line indicates average early earnings. And we can see that um, there are a higher number of claimants um, on the pandemic unemployment payment who were originally in low paid positions. So about a fifth of the workers claiming this um, pandemic unemployment payment um, have come from the accommodation and food services sector. Retail was also hardly hit or very hard hit um, by the crisis. And these sectors have a higher concentration of female workers and also young people. And we know um, we've heard a lot about young people actually in the last, uh, actually over the last two Friday seminars, um, we know that the unemployment rate rose from 12.3% to 34% for the 15 to 24 year old age groups at the end of March. So this is really worrying. This is higher than the levels we'd seen in the previous crisis. And I suppose with reduced opportunities for people to emigrate uh, and also reduced maybe number of apprenticeships um, because of social distancing measures and so on that 
that young people might find it quite difficult to get back into work. Um, so how can we care for um, a recovering labour force? And I suppose the response of the public employment services will really be very important here. Traditionally, um, public employment services have been uh, have offered support in terms of job matching, upskilling, um, welfare payment support, CV preparation, all of these types of um, supports. But uh, what about the psychological health of the labour force? Um, and we've seen in recent studies from China, uh, one month into the COVID um, outbreak, that the unemployed and people who had stopped working reported worse mental and physical health and also distress. So we know that this is um, something that's, you know, uh, decreasing psychological well-being is very much associated with uh, unemployment, but also with, with poor employment um, uh, as well. So responding to this crisis induced mass unemployment will be really important. And we know that there's been a kind of a collective trauma that for most of us, it's been quite overwhelming. Um, we've heard from Deirdre and from Finney and how this can kind of trigger stress and anxiety in our everyday lives. But there's also individual trauma. Um, so thinking about the unemployed and how we're going to respond to their needs that many um, people may have uh, intensified in existing traumas. So previous traumas in their life, they may also be experiencing grief and loss of loved ones, of family members, of colleagues. Uh, and we must make sure that the responses that we put in place are not trauma inducing uh, in themselves. And while not everyone has been traumatized, our lives have been severely disrupted. Um, so there's this kind of a sense of needing to debrief and uh, I suppose talk about some of those um, distresses before we start looking at employment options or issues around uh, how we're going to help people back to work. Um, so we know that employment offers us lots of benefits um, from financial rewards, social contacts, use of our abilities and skills, positive mental health, and these are very important. And we know that uh, the, conversely, I suppose, that unemployment um, creates financial penalties, it, it, our skills start to deplete, there are personal or self-identity issues, societal impacts in terms of maybe stigma-related feelings, and also uh, impacts on our physical and mental well-being. And as Finian mentioned, you know, as psychologists, we try to look for the evidence to support um, our assertions around um, the connections maybe between uh, unemployment and its impact on psychological well-being. And um, there's been a lot of research on this since really the 1930s. But more recently, since about the 1980s, with more sophisticated methods of measuring um, impacts of, um, you know, on our mental health, we can see and we, we know very clearly that um, psychological well-being and our subsequent re-employment are, negative are negatively affected by periods of unemployment. And research has linked unemployment to over 100 psychological variables, um, including poor anxiety, uh, reduced cognitive performance, as Jordan mentioned, suicidal ideation, and so on. And we know that there are uh, that people who are unemployed experience lower levels of well-being than are their employed counterparts, or by or, or in comparison with the general population. And the effects can often be multiple. So um, when you're working with somebody who's unemployed, it may not be just low motivation, but it also may be. Uh, decreased wealth being um, loss of confidence, loss of self-esteem, low hopefulness and so on. So there are often multiple uh, effects of unemployment and we must take these, uh, these fact factors into consideration when we're working with the long-term unemployed. So can we learn from previous research? Um, we know that providing adequate psychosocial supports for the labour force should be evidence informed but uh, thankfully, because there are very few um, opportunities to develop and test effective responses um, because we don't have so many um, of these types of crises that we can try and learn from um, maybe other crises, evidence produced after 9-11, evidence produced after uh, Hurricane Katrina and these types of events can really help us. So we try and gather the evidence from related um, experiences to inform our decisions. 
Um, so one of the ways that we can, um, I suppose, gather evidence is to look at theories of um, unemployment and its impact on psychological well-being. And these theories try and help us to um, explain um, the connection between unemployment and well-being. So we have lots of theories, the latent deprivation model, maybe one of the, the um, most uh, well-known, um, which I suppose emphasized the fact that we have uh, the loss of income, but also the loss of these kind of more hidden benefits of work, such as social contact challenges, uh, time, you know, time, putting structure on our day, that these are very important um, benefits to us when we're in work and when we remove them, um, our agency or our control over our work environment is very much reduced or over our, our daily um, time structure is very much reduced. Um, and then Peter War talked about psychologically good and psychologically bad jobs. So we get a lot of benefits from psychologically good jobs, not so many from psychologically bad jobs. Um, and there's been a lot of research in this area, but he also looked at this in the context of psychologically good and bad unemployment. And really, I suppose the lesson here is that we should try and um, help the unemployed to maintain uh, the benefits um, that we get from psychologically good work and um, to try and introduce that as part of the public employment service response. We can also learn from best practice guidelines and principles, some of which I'll look at in a moment. Um, and also there are evidence-based interventions, randomized controlled trials, experiments, longitudinal studies, um, where we can look at the you know, good interventions and, and what's good about them and who are they good for. We can also learn from wider psychology and social sciences. And I think um, we've, we've heard a lot, and uh, I know last week uh, Orla Mundoon mentioned the positive mental health uh, benefits that we get from this kind of national solidarity, and that perhaps a collective back to work campaign based on a culture of care and hope could be very useful at the moment. So looking after our labor force um, in terms of designing interventions and services, to do this. Uh, as I said, there's not a lot of evidence around uh, post-disaster psychosocial interventions, but um, Hopfall and colleagues identified some key principles that should guide our, how we develop our services. And they said that um, really any services that we put in place should promote a sense of safety for people, have a calming effect, um, a sense of self and community community efficacy, so feeling more in control of what we're doing and how we do it, a sense of connectedness, so a togetherness, and this kind of comes back to the solidarity. And most importantly, I think, a sense of hope, and this is one of the key factors that often arises for um, people who are unemployed to try and help people increase their levels of hopefulness. And we can also learn from um, research into trauma-informed care. And a lot of social services would use these types of guidelines to uh, work with people who would have experienced previous traumatic events in their lives. And really the point is to make sure that you're promoting healing and reducing risk of re-traumatization. So very similar terms to Hopfall's um, guidelines, you know, creating a sense of safety, trustworthiness, this kind of collaborative approach, and giving people empowerment and choice in terms of um, what they decide to do and how they decide to do it. Um, and also recognizing the intersectionality, so the range of maybe multiple um, barriers that people might be perceiving. Um, and of course, this is quite, quite difficult in the current context. How do you deliver individualized services while still maintaining social distance measures? And I think these are going to be around for quite a while. So um, guidance practitioners working in public employment services um, and in associated services will be very familiar with um, using um, a lot of these kind of practices in their daily work. So um, career development um, has been shown to have very positive mental health outcomes um, from you know looking at life effects. So the barriers or, or maybe the individual's whole life and how they're going to try and then get back to work um, in terms of improving their abilities, their self-perception, um, and also how others perceive perceive them and how they present themselves. 
um, to an employer or um, on the labour market. We, there's also learning from mental health research. So Professor Jim Lucy in Trinity talks about three ORs of anxiety management, resilience, reframing, recovery. And these are, um, again, concepts that guidance practitioners are very familiar with and would use in their daily work. Um, research that I've been involved in myself, um, a randomised control um, based in a local employment service in North Dublin, um, found that the local employment services had a very positive effect on reducing levels of psychological distress, increasing hopefulness, self-esteem, career efficacy and perceived employability in the long term unemployed. And the research that I'm currently involved in with uh, Dr. Mary Murphy at Maynooth University, uh, we've shown some qualitative, I suppose we have qualitative findings uh, around positive personal and psychosocial outcomes from the local employment services. And importantly, I think services uh, must have the capacity and competence to deliver these types of services um, moving into the future. And really they should be based on a robust uh, triage and profiling system where we can really identify uh, what type of needs each individual uh, that presents to the service has and making sure that we, we design our services around them uh, so that we can meet their needs. Um, so the next slide is really looking up, I suppose, about our labour market policy choices. So how do we support the unemployed within the current context? And if we look at the right side of this continuum of labour market policy options, we see the work first model, and that's really our current model. Um, it's been quite successful over the last number of years in terms of supporting people back into work um, since the financial crisis. Um, however, there is a lot of evidence to show that people who are more distant um, from the labour market have really not had positive outcomes um, from this type of model. Um, this model tries to quickly move people back into work. Um, it's a kind of a fair weather um, policy which works well when we have strong labour demand, but when um, when there is weak labour demand, which is currently the case, this model might not be so effective um, as there's not so many jobs in the labour market to uh, help people to quickly move into. Um, and critiques of this model would suggest that it tends to move people into or has a link with low paid work. And as we move towards the left of this um, continuum, we can see the human capital model, which is very much based on skill and competence development, enabling sustainable access into work and in, in work transitions in career development, and moving on then to the more capability and well-being informed work life model, uh, which is more about freedom to choose and co-designing of service and on into a life first model, which I suppose would be the ultimate model in terms of uh, providing holistic support and prioritizing life needs of individuals, work being one of those life needs, very much informed by um, theories of capability and well-being. So how we use these models and whom we use them with will be really important in the coming uh, months, I think. And much of this really depends on the demand side and how the economy picks up and the types of jobs that become available. So achieving the right balance between caring for the labour force on the one hand and reigniting the economy on the other will be really important. And just this is my final slide, really some take home points. Um, so if I was to be suggesting, um, you know, some kind of key things that we should, should consider that I think firstly, we should consider and recognise the negative psychological impact that unemployment can have on people, uh, coupled with the crisis related anxiety and distress that maybe we are all feeling, uh, to, acknowledging, to acknowledge the varying needs of the labour force, that uh, the labour force are, um, there's much, you know, they're quite heterogeneous in their makeup and that each individual will have different needs. So to be able uh, to have our services, I suppose, flexible uh, and able to adapt to meet the needs of each individual, to try and promote a culture of care and hope um, moving forward and this again we have this great um, I suppose range of public private and not-for-profit resources at our hands um, that may be trying to create a public employment ecosystem that would be guidance led and that would support people back into sustainable employment and you know maintain positive well-being in our labour force moving into the future. Um, to build on these current uh, feelings of national solidarity 
by having a collective back to work campaign, I think would be very positive um, for those, you know, feeling of solidarity with those who are unemployed at the moment. Uh, to try and be as informed by evidence, by principles and by values as we can be. And that strengthening the positive mental health and well-being of the labour force and promoting hopefulness and self-efficacy should really be the core objectives of a national response. Um, this is all based on research uh, being conducted at the moment at Minute with my colleagues, Mary Murphy, Michael McGann and Philip Finn. And we do have a forthcoming publication, The High Road Back to Work, um, which will hopefully be launched on the 25th of May. And we have a Zoom seminar also coming up on the 5th of June related to this research. So if you'd like any more information on this, please do contact me and we would be delighted to uh, send it out to you. So I'll leave it there, uh, Stephen. I hope that's okay. That was that was far better than okay. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, can can the other panelists please turn their videos on so I can um, put the questions to you? So we've got we've got uh, quite a few questions, and they're they're uh, some of them are, are, are they're they're a little bit tough. I'm not going to lie. That these these questions as they've come through um, as they've come through uh, in the various crisis conferences uh, have been you know they have been challenging, and that's really good. Um, that uh, um, and thank you to everybody who's sending <laughs> questions. We have about I don't know half an hour um, to to answer some of these. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read read them out, um, and I'll go uh, Finian, Deirdre, Nula, and then come back to Finian for the answers if that's all right. Okay. Uh, so for Finian, um, anonymous asks, what data was used to construct the graph of the rhythm of the current working day? And you. Um, uh, another attendee asks, uh, an, anon an anonymous attendee, uh, how do you feel a subordinate can draw those qualities out of their manager where there is a culture of mistrust in a company? Wow, <laughs> nice easy question. Okay. Um, and then from uh, Irene, I find the binary nature of stop start difficult to understand in a context where gray is the new normal and not knowing, not understanding, etc. Surely learning to manage in uncertainty is an opportunity that would require us to feel contain until we're able to think with and then act out of such that stop start seems a too crude an approach what are your thoughts i mean that's an exam question there irene fair play to you that's 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 hardcore but um uh, uh that, <laughs> that that's good um uh and um yeah let me go to to deirdre next so that's that's your homework uh now finian for a second um uh, to Deirdre now from Valerie, uh, do you have any advice for people working in caring professions, e.g. youth work, where staff are aware that young people, that young people they are working with are really struggling and may be very vulnerable. The worker is limited in what they can do and worrying constantly about that young person. The worker is really struggling to switch off. That's an incredibly tough situation to be in, um, Valerie. Uh, I, think, I think we all know people in, in those situations. So yeah, um, really, really good and very, very important question. Um, uh, Nessa Childers, um, if I'm right, is former MEP, Nessa Childers. Uh, 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 are we sufficiently prepared for burnout in the pandemic? This was raised by C Carrie Cooper as a real risk by at least September. This may mean we work less. Very good point, Nessa. Um, and uh, uh, Anonymous asks, again for Deirdre, there is a sense of guilt that comes along with not being as productive as usual. How can employees manage this? Wow, you're getting the real easy ones here, Deirdre. This is grand. And um, one for Nula uh, and Stephen. Is there a case for universal basic income in this situation? So we're on to Nula now. Is there, a, is there a case for universal basic income in this situation where many jobs may return? Again, from NASA. Um, uh, one for Deirdre now, sorry. What are some ways of motivating yourself when you currently don't like your work? Very good. And then for Finian, Given the cognitive abilities of staff, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry I, just, I just had a child just just like run past the back of the thing, <laughs> like you know, doing this. <laughs> sorry, excuse, sorry, everyone. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Given the cognitive abilities of staff and their leaders are compromised, oh, this is for Finian again, in the current COVID working environment, what practical steps can be taken to minimize an adverse impact on the business? Mary Murphy, uh, 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 Dr. Mary Murphy, I think, uh, Anna Coop's version of universal basic services, so this is for NULA, um, you know, would it be a more enabling concept? 
Um, and then we have we have many more, but I think I might stop there uh, in, in in just because it, otherwise it'll just be me reading our questions um, for ten more minutes because there's there's loads of questions coming in. So. Um, Finny, can I start with you, please? So nice, easy, hop the ball kind of questions to, to you first, but all really, really important ones as well. Okay, let, let's take the uh, the graph out of the uh, out of the question. So I, I think it's a, probably the only uh, slide that I showed that wasn't based on evidence. How based on evidence, that's the yellow line that I showed, which we, we have lots of evidence to show the, almost like the circadian rhythm of performance during a day. So we have 20, 30 years of research on that. Uh, and that's easily found. You'll even get that on Wikipedia. You don't have to go to Google Scholar to find that. The purple line that I shared was more my uh, attempt at trying to map what is going on in the current situation, because we don't have any research on this. Uh, we've never had an enforced lockdown like this before, certainly not in the Western world, where we've been able to map uh, the, the performance or the the rhythm of working for, for individuals in the day. So I was hypothesizing that uh, based, I'll admit, on my own working rhythm, but also looking at those team members that I work with who just, uh, you know, are trying to deal with the, with the roles, the responsibilities and pressures that they face, face every other day. And what is clear to me as a team leader in this is nobody is working eight, eight hours a day. Nobody is working eight, 10 hours a day. And if they are, Although our traditional research on remote working would say that remote workers outperform those who are co-located. Okay, that's an important point. So those who choose to work remotely and virtually have traditionally outperformed those who work in the office. Uh, and there's lots of reasoning behind this. We, we know why it has to do with the choice and the timing and the work-life balance and all the rest of it. But what we're facing currently is not that scenario. We're trying to work from home when we have several other uh, demands on our uh, on our time uh, and we don't have the supports that we would normally have so what i was trying to get across to in that graph is what i was trying to get across is a manager or leader can must 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 step out and just lose the old uh, traditional switch off the daily clock idea that's not what's what's happening if you if if there's work that needs to be done we need to think about it in a project in project terms. So this is the project at deliverable at some stage in the future. How you get there in a way is almost your own, uh, is, is something that we've got to give control to the team workers or the employees for. They have to be able to craft it given their context, the demands on their time, the rhythm of their daily lives, that they have to be able to take control of them. So that's the graph one. Are we okay with that, do you think, Stephen? Yep, great. Okay, uh, the mistrust uh, uh, question that's that's a really good question is you know I have a manager uh, who at this moment is not showing me any of the trust cues that I would expect of him or her and look this really is a problem uh, and it's where management and leadership development I think there'll be an awful lot of us of our universities and business schools and executive education units over the coming months running courses on this which is how do we take traditional managers and turn their their perspective to be effective for optimal leaders and managers in a virtual scenario um, and it really is different because what's happening is you, re, you you've got to relinquish control you, you're not work, watching a person between nine and five and monitoring what they're doing and being able to see are they producing are they are they working effectively is their rhythm consistent that's gone based on the point i've just said uh, said or mentioned before this so in a, in a way, it's a mindset change that we need to get across to them. Your questioner is, 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 is correct. It's she or he has recognized that they have a poor manager and really in a way it's up to the employee to try and nudge that manager to a point of understanding what's going on for the employee. Mm -hmm. I think that's got to happen in a one-to-one. -one. So it cannot happen in a team Zoom meeting but it's got to be, can we talk about what's happening here with the manager? Look, I will produce the goods, but here's what's facing me. I have a dependent that's sick. I have worries about children. I have whatever else is going on. We have to put that level and straight with the manager and say, if you give me latitude, I'll commit to you that I will deliver on this project, but I need you to give me the space and the autonomy to do it 
inside the confines and boundaries that I'm facing at the moment. So it, it's sort of trying to get to a point where you can have that adult to adult conversation. I'll hold my hands up and I say, look, there's lots of bad managers out there. We'll never get them to that point, And that's unfortunate. Um, but I think very quickly organizations will begin to, uh, I suppose, isolate and understand who really are their top performing managers in the current situation. Because the word will come back that, that Finian is not a great manager. He's still trying to control me, although the, the context is entirely different. And that's not helping my performance. It's not helping me deliver. That message will get through pretty quickly. And I think organizations in their managers and leaders for the future will be looking at an extra set of criteria or competencies that they haven't had looking at, uh, haven't been looking for before. And that's the ability to motivate and coach staff remotely and virtually. So I'm not sure I've answered the question uh, for the questioner, but, but you know, I think that one-to-one -one, uh, being honest and authentic with that manager uh, is probably the first step that they should take. The third question then, and I'll leave it at that, Stephen, to, to hand on to others. The third question that I noted was the, the piece about reduced cap capability and re reduced uh, capacity uh, of workers, given that as all of us, I think, have recognized that we are under a degree of stress. Now, I'm not for a second suggesting that the stress is debilitating such that we're putting up our hands saying, I can't do that project. But it's just that our thresholds have been lowered a little bit. Mm. And it's really important yeah. for leaders and managers to understand that. So how, how as a leader do I, do I work with my team when I understand that? I go on my I go on one to ones again, and I st let's say you're my you're my uh, team team member, Stephen. I'm having a one to one with you where I'm asking you, okay, let's you you, you tell me what you think is capable um, in terms of delivery date for this. Let's let's craft that out. What does that mean? How many days? How many hours? And what I'd say I'd even be intuitive this. And again, using psychological science here, we have a thing called the project fall fallacy, which is I'll get this project done by Friday or Friday week, okay? That never works, okay? We always underestimate the amount of time that we're going to put into a project. So a little tip to work with that is say, okay, you think it's Friday week on the delivery. Can we work back from that a little bit and see what will you be doing on Thursday? What will you be doing on Wednesday? What will you be do doing on Tuesday? Not to overly control the employee, but actually to bring it into their mind that, you know what, maybe Friday is ambitious. And then for the leader to say, well, that's okay. If it can't be Friday, let's push it on to the following week. So you, you, you negotiate and you craft out the amount of time, leaving plenty of flexibility in it for that individual to, uh, to do the job. Now, another piece of psychological research or science would say here, if you allow a worker to set their own goals, their own delivery points, rather than me setting them as the manager and leader, they're like, what is it, two to three times? My, my, psych, my psychologist uh, colleagues here will, will, will uh, confirm this. We're two to three times more likely to deliver on them. In other words, if I set my goal, way more likely to deliver it than if you set it for me. So again, do that crafting negotiating piece and give flexibility You know, when, when, when your employee is saying, I'll have it done by Friday or I'll have it by Wednesday of next week. Say, okay, let's work back from that. Maybe, maybe we can push it out to Friday if you want. Uh, you, you, you take control of it and come back to me if you need any more assistance, any more help, um, then talk to me. The point, important point here, Stephen, is that we're, we're talking about uh, leaders and managers understanding this reduction of capa cognitive capacity, wearing a hat, the hat of a coach, not of a ah. controller, but of a coach. How do I get this person to produce, you know, it optimally and within their own space and within their own comfort levels? Mm -hmm. this, this is the game we got to play now. I think that this may change when, you know, if we return to uh, to something more more normal in the future, but just at the moment when we're all suffering in, 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 through what, what both Nula, Nula and Deirdre have explained, uh, I think we've got to wear this coaching hat. Okay, brilliant. Um, uh, I, think, uh, I think two things are really interesting from your responses. The, the first is that managers need to actually learn how to manage and lead virtually. That's really interesting and then uh coaching virtually as well so those two yeah. things are there that those are skill sets none of us have you yeah. know um and so the the the, the 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 sense of a gap yeah. between those things is is uh yeah is, is very 
very, very important. And speaking of important, Valerie Duffy's point uh, uh, for Deirdre about how do you, do you have any advice for people working in caring professions? So youth work, they're, they're stressed out because they're, the people that they're caring for and working with are stressed out and they're, they're constantly worried. What, what, what do you think they should do? Yeah, so that's a, a very um, real situation that obviously a lot of people are finding themselves in. Um, we did uh, some research a couple of years ago where we actually looked at people who um, were caregivers, so professional caregivers, which would be a similar kind of context, I think, the, the situation this person is talking about. Um, and one very um, simple, straightforward thing that you can do in this situation, um, which is hugely important for us, is to think about the meaning and the impact that you're having on other people. Um, and that can be as simple as, you know, before you leave work at the end of the day, to write down in a little notebook book, what is one positive, meaningful thing that you have achieved today in terms of helping somebody and so on. Another thing that I think is important in that situation is we often jump into problem-focused coping. So how do we solve this problem? We cannot solve these problems that, and, and the situations that we find ourselves in today. So what we have to do is deal with more the emotion, um, the, the emotional side of coping. Um, so, I, so literally to be an emotional support for, for the uh, people and the young people that this person is working with um, and to recognize that, they're, that we cannot solve the problems. Um, and sometimes by letting go of that kind of idea that we can um, yeah, solve this problem um, can be a small help in terms of trying to switch off. Um, so, so that can be um, one thing there. Uh, I'm going to jump back up to the previous question, um, sure. not to jump over the challenging ones. I think that's really important. Um, so Irene had talked about the binary nature of the stop, start, mm, self-control yes. and so on. And that's actually a really interesting idea that um, is it too binary? So one of the challenges we have when we're trying to deal with this type of stuff is how do we, how do we control our emotions? How do we control our thoughts and so on and so forth? Um, and the point that I was trying to get across and when I was talking about that is we often try to suppress them actually and we try to push them down and stop us feeling ourselves, stop feeling worried, stop feeling anxiety. And we feel like it's a bad thing that we should do that. It's a completely normal thing that we actually feel in this way. Um, but sometimes this idea of trying to stop ourselves doing this um, can be, um, can almost, it can bounce back and, and work against us. On the other hand, it is beneficial to stop working at the end of the day um, or to have a point where we do stop working. And so the, the stop thing is not, you know, just something that we, we try not to do, but is important that we do in other ways. Um, but some ways to try to stop ourselves feeling this anxiety is to switch to try and doing something or achieving something that, you know, is even just a small win and so on. Um, so, Irene, you're absolutely right that it is um, too rudimentary. The reality of the situation is what we're doing in this stuff is we're constantly um, moving through different episodes in our day. And if you were to take that sort of idea of stopping and starting and putting it into Finian's graph, which he's saying is not evidence-based, but there actually is quite a lot of evidence that we have ebbs and flows and we move through different episodes throughout the day. Um, how we successfully manage the interruptions that come in and the... Um, the, the productivity, productivity concerns that we all have and so on. Um, that idea of stopping and starting is a continuous um, ebbing and flowing and, and, and through performance episodes through the day um, is kind of where it, it becomes not crude, but actually more sort of reflective of reality. So I, I hope that answers your question in that regard. Um, and the third one I'm going to move on to because I'm conscious of time, so I'm not going to spend too much on any, any question. But Nessa, you asked the question about are we sustainable sufficiently prepared for burnout in the pandemic. One of the things that we have to remember is that burnout is an end state. Um, so burnout doesn't happen overnight. Burnout is something that happens over time. So I think we should be thinking right now about how do we actually manage people's workload? You know, I think most of us would probably say that in the last six weeks, we've been in crisis mode. And in crisis mode, we, we flip into a situation of acute stress um, our adrenaline is up, you know, we're, we're actually achieving an awful lot. If we look at what organizations have done in the last six weeks, it is phenomenal. We have organizations that have moved to an entirely virtual organization. We have businesses that have entirely redesigned their, yeah, their whole way of operating, their whole way of working. We have, um, you know, hospitals and, and health services that have, have ramped up to a, a point that we would not have believed was possible um, in six years, not to mind six weeks. And so we have achieved a lot, but that does have a cost in terms of um, yeah, the energy that it has taken, the effort that it has taken and so on. So what we have to try to do now is find a way that we can manage that in a sustainable way. We know that there's a number of ways of doing that. So we can look at the resources that we have. 
um, in our jobs, and many of which have been taken away. But things like social support, things like structuring, um, um, structuring tasks, having realistic expectations about what people can achieve, and, and, um, and that goes across the board from an individual employee to an entire health sector, um, but how, um, to how quickly things can be delivered. So having re realistic expectations, I think, is going to be a really important thing to try to avoid burnout in the long term. Um, and I think the, the really important thing that um, organizations need to emphasize here is that, um, and, and this is partly what Finine has been say, talking about as well, is that we cannot simply expect to continue the way we've always continued, to perform at the same level that we've always performed. And I think we have to recognize that um, this is not typical, this is not normal, and so that the level of work and what work productivity that happens cannot be the same. Um, and that goes also not just for when we're talking with managers, but also when we're you know, thinking about the services that we normally take for granted or how long it takes to get something delivered or um, how people um, in supermarkets are managing and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that's going to be really important. And um, yeah, I should probably pause there and pass over to Mula um, to answer some of the questions. And I come from her one. Yeah, okay, so my questions um, were about universal, universal basic income and universal basic services. <clears throat> and I suppose with universal basic income, I think the jury is kind of still out on, on this one. Um, however, we do know that um, the, the loss of, of earnings is one of the key reasons why people experience psychological distress when they become unemployed. And, there is very good research from Paul and Moser in 2009, which showed that uh, countries that have higher levels of social welfare support for the unemployed, um, the, the unemployed experience less psychological distress. So where there is less social welfare supports in place um, to replace people's loss of earnings, uh, people tend to experience um, higher levels of psychological distress. So, um, and I think there's a lot of, lots of maybe anecdotal evidence at the moment um, that, for many people who were in low paid jobs and who are now getting the pandemic unemployment payment of 350 euro per week, that this is quite generous uh, in terms of being able to replace the loss of their income. And that this has gone quite, you know, it's done quite a lot to help mitigate the, the you know, the harshness that they may experience from a, a loss in income. So I do think there are definitely, um, you know, uh, reasons to support universal basic income because it provides a kind of a security net, I suppose, if these types of crises were, if we were to experience these types of crises uh, more often, there is definitely, um, you know, reasons why we might agree with the universal basic income. And it does add that kind of level of security so that we're not, you know, it's not a worry um, for society in general. In terms of you know, basic, uh, universal basic services, um, uh, being an enabling concept, absolutely. Um, I think again it goes back to this kind of um, sense of safety and you know feeling secure that even during periods of unemployment, uh, that there is this standard service that um, is for everybody in society that we can all avail of, that we can easily avail of, um, that it's maybe not connected to our duration of unemployment or. Uh, our, you know, experiences in the past in terms of the labour market. Uh, and this would create, I suppose, trust in the, uh, the national services and institutions for unemployed people. And definitely from my experience in, in Ballymun over the years, that there often is a lack of trust um, between the people experiencing maybe ongoing levels of unemployment and the institutions that are there. The types of policies can often be perceived as quite punitive. Um, so creating a different perception of those, uh, I think, would do a lot to help people feel more secure um, during periods of unemployment like this, where it's really out of everybody's control. Um, we've had no control over this. There's a real sense of kind of free falling. And I think the, the ECB um, yesterday even, you know, mentioned this kind of sense of free fall in the economy. Um, so that's quite worrying for society as a whole. Um, so I, th I think, you know, the sense of a universal provision of income and services will do a lot to, um, to help alleviate a lot of the stress and distress people are feeling at the moment. 
I don't know if that answers the questions. Um, no, that's 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 yeah. fantastic. And um, yeah. there is another uh, question uh, from uh, another anonymous person for you, Nula. Do you think the current unemployment service system has the capacity to support the expected increased number of unemployed individuals? Uh, yes, um, I do think there's quite a, still quite a lot of capacity there that was created after the the crisis in 2008-2009. So really since around 2013-2014 with Intrio, uh, we also have um, private providers um, operating the job path program um, and then the local employment services. So I think with those three types of services, there's quite a lot of capacity. I think it's just making sure that the right people get into the right services. Mm. And this kind of comes yeah. back to the triage. So this is really, really important at the beginning to, to have a really good assessment and not just a statistical profiling led assessment of people and their needs. I think it has to be that alongside a caseworker or you know, someone who is expert and who, can, who really understands each of those services and what they can provide and also then what the needs of the person that's presenting in front of them might be. Um, so I think, I think there is quite a lot of capacity there. I also think there's a lot of not-for-profit services that operate in this space, uh, community-based services, youth services, where there is a lot of expertise, homeless services um, often have people who look specifically at unemployment and helping their clients reaccess the labour market. So I think, you know, really making an assessment of what's available and being able to route people or, you know, direct them into the right services to meet their needs, there is capacity uh, to do this, uh, much more than we think, maybe. So I think it's about utilising everything we have better. Brilliant. I, I've been. Uh, I have to say, I have been. Um, I have been incredibly impressed at the response of um, the Intrio offices and um, most of the state, actually, uh, in 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 its response to this. Um, it, you know, the, the state is comprised of people, and the, the work that they've done has been, you know, g genuinely uh, uh, brilliant. Um, as has th been this panel. It, it, it's been brilliant. Uh, just want to. There, there's. Uh, there's. There's quite a few questions, um, but in respect of everyone's time, Margaret says, I just want to take the opportunity to say you're playing a blinder, sharing information, practicing, uh, working collectively. The positive I will take from the pandemic is that at the heart, people are co-operators. Thank you all and keep up sharing the good work. And Irene says, well done all, uh, very helpful and worthwhile. Keep going with this forum as possible. Economy as a social entity, uh, uh, time has come. <laughs> so lots of opportunities uh, to move the dial from corporate thinking to a citizen focused approach, um, which is exactly what, what we're trying to do. It's, it's precisely why we set um, these, uh, these responses up, uh, Irene. Uh, um, the, the, like it, like it, it has been lashed together, uh, but um, in a very high quality way. I, <laughs> but that's mostly down to the panelists, I have to say. Um, so uh, let me uh, stop, uh, let me just uh, finish off by um, uh, thanking our, um, our, uh, uh, our uh, hosts. So Mark and Patrick have been in the background here, uh, making sure that the, the, um, the tech works um, and that it's all been uh, working well. Um, if they've been getting it wrong, that I've been talking to myself for two hours, which is, <laughs> well, it wouldn't be unheard of. Um, so thanks, uh, Mark and Patrick. Um, Thanks to everyone who commented. Um, you know, we've got we've got loads of very good questions, high quality, n not easy, and very interesting questions for all the panelists. Thank you uh, uh, to to uh, them. Thank you to the participants who stayed um, uh, for the whole thing. That's been brilliant. And finally, most importantly, thank you to the uh, speakers, uh, uh, to and to Deirdre, and to Nula. Um, that was just brilliant, and um, it it just shows just how broad the uh, response has to be. You know, there have like economics is 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 obviously fantastic and wonderful, but um, there's 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 just so much it, that social science can bring to this um, that 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 can, can bring to this massive question, and you know, social science, psychological science, hard science, and everything. So it's been it's been uh, remarkably um, uh, uplifting. So. Um, uh, bang on the, the, the stroke of 11.30, we'll stop. And um, I'd like to thank you all again and have a, uh, a very nice day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Thanks very much, Stephen. Bye. Good luck. Ciao.